Hi all, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name's Dan and I'll be your MC for this evening. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and the land upon which we meet in Sydney where we're meeting for the webinar. It's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and of course we pay respects to our Indigenous owners around the country. Tonight you've joined us for the, uh, launch, the launch of Stand Up for Solar, a campaign of solar citizens. We've just held five launch events in cities around Australia with nearly a thousand people coming along. These included Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and, and on the Sunshine Coast. We've brought, provided this online webinar for people who couldn't make it to one of those events. And it's fantastic having so many of you guys here and I can still see the numbers climbing as we start speaking. But before we go any further, what we want to start by doing is asking, find out a little bit more about you, about the people who've dialed in on this cold night uh, to have a chat to us. So we've set up a quick poll, so there's an online poll that you can participate in uh, and you can participate in right now. So the poll should be coming up on your screen uh, and the question is this, we know you love your solar but is it because you have solar, you want solar or you work in the solar industry? So what you'll need to do is tick your response there and we'll read out that for, in just a moment when you fill out that poll. So while we're waiting I thought I'd give you guys some fun facts about solar power. Uh, did you know that according to the Clean Energy Regulator, we've almost hit 1.4 million solar systems installed? That's pretty amazing, 1.4 million households living under a solar roof. We've got 83% done, we're getting there slowly but surely. Fun fact two, and another thing you might not know, is that the top three electors in Australia that have the most solar PV systems are Wright and Kennedy in Queensland, and Mayo in South Australia. We're closing off the poll now with the quest questions and we'll be able to bring you the results. So we know you love solar but it's because 70% of you love have solar, 31% want solar and 9% and of you work in the industry. Thanks very much. Now we'll come to our second poll question. Remember, in this poll question you can choose more than one option if you wish. So what are you hoping to get out of this webinar? Are you hoping to learn more about solar in Australia? Learn more about the community organisation, Solar Citizens? Learn more about our campaign, Stand Up for Solar? Or find out how you can help protect and grow solar in Australia? Or number five is not sure. So please fill in that question as you go along. And while we have those results coming in, I just want, thought I'd show you this. This is a map of where people from Australia, you see, from where people tonight are joining us from all over Australia. It should be coming up in just a moment. Okay, that's okay. We'll show that out for you in just a minute. Um, I'll give you another fun fact while you're filling out the poll. And another thing you may not know is that the bottom three electorates that have the fewest solar PV systems are Wentworth and Sydney in New South Wales and Melbourne Ports in Victoria. So we're nearly there with the results, we're 90%, so there's a few people who are still waiting to come along. Let's see what we've got. We're going to close it now. So just waiting for those details to come up. So what we can see here is 63% of people who have come along want to learn more about solar in Australia. 45% want to learn more about the community organisation, Solar Citizens. 65% want to learn more about our campaign, Stand Up for Solar. And 79% want to know how they can help protect and grow solar in Australia. And others of you aren't sure, but that's great. By the end of the night, you'll have lots of ideas for what you can do to work with us. So tonight we're here to launch Stand Up for, Stand Up for Solar. This is a campaign run by Solar Citizens. Oh, and you can see there the map directly in front of you, which indicates where all of the people around Australia and a few international people, I've been, I've been told, have gathered to hear about our campaign Stand Up for Solar. Stand Up for Solar is a campaign designed to pull solar and renewable energy out of the political quicksand. We want to see a bold and ambitious plan uh, for solar and renew renewable energy within Australia and tonight you're going to find out how we can do it and how you can help us. So what we're going to start by doing is take you through the program for this evening. Just waiting for my screen to come up. Just as a, little, um, as a little thing, if you have questions throughout the evening, there is a chat function on your screen where you can type your questions and we'll be selecting questions and going through those at the end. So we've done the interactive poll questions and you can see we've got a variety of different people from a variety of different backgrounds, all here to learn more about solar in their communities. 
Um, we'll, we'll be hearing very soonly from our keynote speaker, Nigel Morris. We'll then be hearing from the National Director of Solar Citizens, Claire O'Rourke, who will be taking you through the campaign plan to stand up for solar. We'll then be going through your questions and trying to get some answers from our amazing speakers. At 6.35, um, and once we've gone through those questions, we'll move into an interactive poll question where you can tell us how you're going to stand up for solar. We'll then do a wrap up of everything we've learned tonight. We've also got a video message from Danny Kennedy we'll be sending out shortly after this webinar. So without further ado, uh, to, to get into, the, um, into, our, all the, into our campaign plan, um, I wanted to introduce our first keynote speaker, Nigel Morris. Nigel is the Director of Solar Business Services and a solar industry expert. He has almost 20 years of experience in the PV industry, including in the management and supply of literally hundreds of large and small scale solar projects around Australia. We're really lucky to have Nigel join us tonight and I'd like to thank Nigel for joining us. So introducing you to Nigel Morris. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I, uh, it's great to imagine that you're out there. I can see the numbers, so I know that you are. Um, and um, I'll do my absolute best to imagine a vast crowd of you enthusiastically listening to uh, to some stories from the world of solar. I'm going to jump straight into it and um, uh, just follow some instructions there. Bear with me. I'll get rid of that. And uh, I'll get rid of that. And there we are. There we are. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's dive straight in, and, and I think I always like to start the story um, of, of how I got into solar and you know what really got me interested in solar by going right back to the beginning. Um, if we can jump to the next slide, you'll see uh, hopefully an image of a piece of fruit, and, and uh, ironically it was that a tomato uh, that got me started in the whole world of solar and thinking indeed about energy. Um, around 30 years ago, I was travelling through Europe, as uh, a lot of Aussies do, uh, in a Volksy, beat up old Volksy with my girlfriend, and we were uh, in Germany at the time, uh, and uh, we were surviving on on pretty basic rations, uh, bread, cheese, the, the other basics, uh, and and we treated ourselves to fruit and vegetables like tomatoes from time to time. When we were in Germany. Uh, we went into a fruit and vegetable shop and we were confronted uh, with uh, an unusual sight. Um, we saw tomatoes there, but some of the tomatoes had a sign on it, uh, a sticker on it that looked just like this one that you'll see coming up on your screen. Um, unbelievably, there was a nuclear radiation symbol on a tomato and uh, we eventually, after a little while, found someone who could speak English and got them to explain to us that um, because of the fallout from Chernobyl, there was a risk that those tomatoes uh, could be radioactive or at least partially contaminated by the radio uh, radioactive fallout. Um, of course, they were on special, so they were cheap, uh, and, and he encouraged us if we wanted cheap tomatoes that they were the ones to buy, um, uh, and of course they had more expensive ones if you didn't feel like eating radioactive tomatoes. Uh, the, the real part of this story for me, though, was as a young man, uh, only 18 years old, um, it was the first time that the true profound implications of, of uh, switching a light switch on um, uh, were borne home to me. I never really understood um, the profound impact that energy generation can have on the environment around us and it, it, it really got me thinking. It took me a while to, uh, to work out how I was going to get in uh, to an industry and, and, and actually do something about that, but that, that radioactive tomato stuck with me. Uh, right through till today, ironically. If we go forward to the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, I was lucky enough to get a break into the solar industry um, uh, some years later and um, uh, uh, back in uh, around 94 when I was uh, uh, first in the industry, um, I was in involved with a, a very small company, well, at that time one of the largest solar companies, but a small company in rural New South Wales. Uh, and you can see a bunch of statistics and facts and figures there that, that kind of highlight how much the industry has changed. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of a system, uh, 
um, has changed dramatically um, uh, since those early days. And we used to, in fact, uh, sit around, I can remember sitting around in meetings thinking, won't it be great one day when we actually can hook these things up to the grid instead of doing always doing off-grid systems or helping people in remote areas or in indigenous villages or other places. And, and we could see that one day it was actually going to, to be a reality and that systems would be connected to the grid. Um, you know, the largest solar panel you could get back then um, was 75 watts. Um, you'd pay somewhere around $11 a watt for a solar panel, and today they're you know around a dollar a watt, and panels up around three, 300 watts. Uh, and a system would cost 30 or 40 thousand dollars, which today will only cost you three or four thousand dollars. So it's been just remarkable to see the change in this industry. Um, both in terms of, uh, I noticed the colour of my beard, uh, and also in the uptake of solar. We'll jump through to the next slide, and uh, what I should be able to do then is, is describe to you um, uh, graphically how the industry has grown. W one of the things that I spend a, a huge amount of time doing is, is uh, keeping track of what's happening in the industry and analysing um, uh, data and facts and statistics so that we can uh, um, keep a track of what's going on and, and, and tell the story about growth in our industry. That next slide will come up in a minute and I'll be able to give you a picture. A lot of the growth that's happened, of course, has happened in the last couple of years uh, when uh, uh, on the back of uh, surges in rebates and feed-in tariffs uh, in combination with the falling price of solar, um, the industry really took off and you can see the graph there. On the right-hand side, you can see approximate annual numbers of systems, so typically you know, 200, 300,000 systems a year being installed in Australia. On the left hand side you can see what that is equivalent to in, in kilowatts. Um, uh, so you know, around about a gigawatt of solar installed in the peak year of 2012, which is just a remarkable result. I mean there's about four gigawatts of solar installed in Australia now. And uh, when, you, when you put it in context of how much energy generation there is in the whole country, there's actually about 45 gigawatts uh, of coal fire and uh, all, all other forms of generation in Australia. So 45 gigawatts in total and about four of solar. So it's, it's an absolutely remarkable result. One of the other things that a lot of people don't know about Australia is that um, we have some of the highest uh, penetration rates of solar on rooftops of any country in the world. Um, our, our market, for a variety of reasons, has left us, uh, or, or is, we've found ourselves in the position where residential solar uh, and particularly smaller systems um, have have been um, the number one market, uh, the number one source of demand, which is quite different to other countries. A lot of other countries have gone down the route of large scale generation and large central solar farms. We've had a real, you know, grassroots, put it on the average uh, home type of marketplace, which has done some really, really incredible things, some, some good things and some bad things depending on where you sit in this industry, of course. We'll go through to the next slide and I'll start describing some of the implications of what we're seeing uh, with that number of residential systems. <clears throat> of course, as I mentioned, many of these things have been driven by support and when you look around the world and look back over the last 20 years in Australia, you'll see uh, the rise and fall and, and, and change in uh, policy favoritism uh, towards solar. Um, and where we're at now, uh, sadly, and in fact I must up, update this graph, but um, you know, we've effectively seen virtually all those incentive mechanisms taken away. Uh, there are some that are, that are kind of there, but they're at risk of, of being cobbled. Um, but a huge number of factors have actually uh, changed to the negative. Um, uh, you know, uh, to hear, for example, our own Prime Minister coming out uh, and talking about um, uh, uh, the, the cost of solar and the impact it has on electricity bills in, 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 a, in a nothing short of a deceptive way really changes community attitude towards solar. We've, we've seen some real attacks on solar because it really is undermining uh, the status quo and it's changing the way things uh, happen in this country and, and uh, it's uh, not always easy to understand um, uh, and, and if you were uh, if you were suspicious, you'd, you'd, you'd think that some people were actually trying to uh, trying to hold solar back. Um, uh, nonetheless, we are where we are, and one of the great things about this market, in fact, is that even in the absence of subsidies, 
consumers won't go away uh, when it comes to their demand for solar. Um, we've seen the market slow down, as you would have seen on the previous graph. Um, but in fact, one of the uh, one of the best parts of of an average day for me, uh, like like happened not too long ago, is when a utility rings me and says, "Nigel, we uh, we need your advice because." We took away the grant, we took away the rebates, uh, and people keep buying solar. We don't know what to do. We don't understand what's going on. Uh, and you have to explain to them that you know the consumer demand for, for this product and how it can help people's um, lives on a day-to-day -day basis is really what keeps it driving. And we're lucky now that we've got pricing that um, that means that for most households, it's it's a good proposition and it's uh, it's quite affordable. Um, we'll go to the next slide, but I'm sure with 70% of you out there have already got solar on. Uh, uh, all of you, I hope, have had a good experience uh, and indeed uh, are seeing those benefits. Um, you also hear a lot of people talking about the fact that um, um, you, you've you've heard about. Uh, peak oil in the past, uh, where where the theory was that we'd reached the peak of the uh, the demand for oil extraction around the world. Well, in fact, we're already at peak fossils, uh, and you can see here there's data from Bloomberg that really clearly shows that you know two th 2013 was the peak of investments in terms of oil, gas, and coal. And ever since then, uh, it's been declining. Uh, and in fact, there's story after story after story after story about how the uh, both the companies and the investments in the fossil fuel industry really are uh, losing favour and a lot of investment banks are, are divesting out of fossil fuel. Um, to the contrary, when you look at what's happening in clean energy, the investments have gone through some uh, ups and downs over the past few years but have a very, very clear trajectory and are in fact challenging fossil fuel investments in the size, uh, you know, staggering, staggering amounts. These are billions, by the way. It doesn't show it on the graph there, but that's billions of dollars of investment. Uh, I saw a number the other day looking at re renewables and clean energy around the world, and it was, you know, uh, two or three hundred, uh, two or three hundred billion dollars a year, just huge numbers. Uh, and, of course, it's still a very small percentage of the total energy market, so there is a, we're only at the beginning of this uh, very exciting change in the way that we generate and use energy around the world. We'll go to the next slide um, because it's worth talking about some of the challenges that we face in this industry. And of course, when energy has been generated the same way for many, many years, uh, hundreds of years in some cases, um, uh, the, the, it's nothing short of a revolution in, in terms of uh, the incumbent industries and um, I, I say to everyone when I do these uh, public presentations that I have the greatest respect for those people who have kept the lights on uh, and have generated energy and helped build economies and um, and my great-grandfather was one of them. He was, uh, he was a coal miner and it, it, it cost him his life. He's buried in Broken Hill. Um, uh, but we owe uh, an enormous debt of gratitude uh, to those who came before us. Um, however, what we really are starting to see now is a lot of resistance to change, which is a pretty normal human characteristic. And, and what we're seeing is an absolute revolution. Um, in fact, I saw a statement today, uh, just today, from New Zealand, where they were talking about some of the uh, uptake uh, statistics from the New Zealand solar industry. And it's only a small industry, but it's growing at a, at a very healthy rate. Uh, and there was a comment there from one of the network companies who, who just, you know, seemed beguiled and, and staggered and said, we never expected this to happen, um, which I find quite um, staggering when you look around the world and you look at the growth rates that we've got elsewhere and the, the, the consumer appetite for this technology. But it really is a very challenging situation. We're seeing the whole way that energy is generated trans being transformed. Uh, we're, we're starting to see... Uh, a, a very a big change from centralised generation, distribution and transmission of energy right down to the household level where householders are passive takers of energy to householders being active uh, consumers who uh, participate in markets uh, who can potentially buy and sell energy uh, either from their solar systems or from storage systems and that's totally changing everything to do with the, solar, uh, with the electricity industry and indeed changing the way that pricing and economics work in that space. Uh, so it is uh, a big challenge, it's a big revolution uh, in terms of what the utilities are seeing. We'll go to the next slide uh, and we'll um, 
uh, talk a little bit more about that because one of the things that really frustrates me is when I hear uh, utilities in particular um, and even some of our senior politicians um, talking about what is um, uh, uh, what is causing the cost of electricity to be as high as it is in Australia? Um, and in fact, you know, I've I've publicly gone after um, the, the the prime minister uh, on several occasions for some of the um, mistruths and misconceptions that he's put out about uh, the impact of the RET in particular. And it might be a little bit hard to see on your screen there, but what that graph on the left, the pie graph on the left, shows that about 92% of your bill is made up of network and transmission charges uh, and retail costs uh, and they have nothing to do at all with solar or the renewable energy target. The little tiny slithers up, slithers up the top are the various schemes. Um, so there's no doubt that, that, that support solar or have supported solar. So there's no doubt that we have a cost. Um, however, I think it's really um, incumbent on uh, our leaders in particular um, to stick to the truth and to stick to the facts about these issues. Uh, and, and it seems to me that picking on such tiny slithers of that pie and uh, pinning all the blame on, uh, on uh, uh, trying to uh, really do something innovative and clever and something that is going to help mums and dads in their homes to reduce their energy prices is a crazy thing to do. There's also uh, a, an ongoing battle that we're having with uh, how the, uh, the cost of electricity and the structure of a typical electricity bill is changing. Um, part of it is out of necessity, uh, part of it, uh, you know, the way our electricity is priced does need to change. Um, uh, but what we're starting to see is things like standing charges being increased dramatically and you can see some examples there uh, of how standing charges have gone up dramatically year after year after year after year after year and in fact we're having a battle right now um, down in South Australia, another one, a small, we have a small win in Queensland today on a similar issue um, uh, around the support for solar and trying to keep it equitable so that those who are prepared to invest can get just rewards. It isn't going to be easy and, and, and the battle is going to, to go on for some time yet I suspect, um, but there's clearly a role for solar um, to play and other renewables to play in the emerging energy economy, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not always easy. We'll go to the next slide and then I suspect I'll be uh, almost out of time, so uh, I'll get it wrapped up. The red, of course, is a really crucial one and you would have seen on the earlier graph that you know, the red is really uh, one of the few uh, if not the only remaining support mechanism that we have for solar in Australia today. Um, it, it actually went to Parliament today. I, I've been watching Twitter and I haven't seen that it's uh, the legislation has been passed yet, um, but we're very close to having resolution. Um, and I'm sure Claire and, and the others will, will touch on that later on. But you know, one of the great things about the RET, having been involved in the industry for a long time, I've watched the the RET come from an idea and through various different forms to what it is today. And in fact, there's more than 10 years of investment and training and education and knowledge and businesses who've structured themselves to manage renewable energy certificates. And it's really done a wonderful job. It's quite an elegant mechanism. It's, it's self-correcting so that it can't overheat too much. Uh, and it's really done what it was aimed, what it was designed to do, and that was to help deploy more solar, to help create jobs, to get more solar on rooftops, and to decrease our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. Um, the current debate is all around, mostly around the large-scale rep, uh, and the uh, and the the issue there has been um, that in combination with the small-scale target. Um, it looks like we're going to go a few percent over the original target, which to me seems like a great success rather than a disaster, but that's been a, a big issue politically. It's almost resolved. We'll go to the next slide and, and I'll finish off. Uh, tens of thousands of jobs out there, of course, and, and what's next is really the interesting, uh, the interesting bit that you read a lot about. Um, this is a diagram that I've put together that's, that's my favourite subject because it's in fact what my house will look like in the next month or so. I've got about uh, two-thirds of the equipment that you see there uh, and, and my house is a, a, is a little pilot case of really what a, a typical house of the future would look like. I'll stress I'm not in a palatial mansion, in fact I'm in a fairly basic 50-year-old uh, property that, in, that I rent off a very amenable landlord. Um, but I've got a solar system on the shed and I'm about to add a second solar system uh, that will be west facing to uh, uh, help shave my afternoon peak energy. I'll have a storage system, uh, one of, I'm a pilot site for the new Enphase uh, AC battery 
so that um, I can store some of my daytime energy and have that available to me in the evenings when I'm paying higher prices for electricity. I've also got a, an electric motorcycle and that electric motorcycle has quite a lot of capacity in it which I'll uh, in the very near future be able to use as well. So I'll actually be able to store it during the day in my Enphase battery bank and then dump it into the bike into the evening and then potentially pull it out of the bike and actually run my house on it as well. Uh, with the advanced communications and control technology that we've got today, all of these things are possible and, and as I keep saying to my boys, you know, my boys will never ride a petrol motorcycle. They'll move straight to electric motorbikes and they'll, they'll expect it to be able to, to run their homes. Uh, I, I can tell that this is a wrap up for me and one of the uh, one of the best lessons that I ever got was from a guy way back when I was a when I was a young man and I went to a seminar and he was talking about climate change for the first time and uh, I walked out feeling quite depressed and, 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 and being part of the problem since I worked in a automotive plant and I said, What do I do, Amory? You know, I, I really don't know how to change what I'm doing and I can't just stop what I'm doing, I only know what I know and I've only got so much money and this was the advice he gave me and it was really simple advice and, and we can all sometimes only take small steps but everyone takes if everyone takes a small step, uh, we can all move forward together. Um, I think that's my last slide. Um, I thank you all for uh, paying, uh, taking the time to come and join us tonight um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Nigel. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. Um, now, we've got a few questions coming in. Just to answer one of them, we will be recording tonight's webinar, so you will be able to listen to this again and get all excited. Um, and there will be time for questions at the end, and we'll go through all your questions that are coming through on the chat. But keep asking them so we know how to, uh, so we, we can try and respond to as many as possible at the end. But now let's get into it. Um, our second keynote speaker has just appeared on my screen, um, and that is Clara Rourke. Clara is the National Director of Soul Citizens. Claire has more than 15 years of extensive experience in communications, advocacy and community campaigning and she's also, like a lot of us here, a proud solar owner. Uh, Claire is a former journalist and campaigner and was part of the Every Australian Counts campaign for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. She's on the line tonight to launch the new campaign, Stand Up for Solar. Thanks so much for joining us, Claire. Hello, I'm just going to get my presentation up here for you. Um, it's, but while I do that, I just want to say how fantastic it is to see hundreds of people from all around Australia who are tuning in tonight and um, thank you for having us into your homes or your workplaces. It's really fantastic and really exciting for us to see that. So um, tonight I'm going to talk to you about the Stand Up For Solar campaign but before I do that, I just thought I should let you know a little bit more about Solar Citizens and where we came from. Um, so Solar Citizens began its life as the 100% Renewable Community Campaign and um, we were basically a coordination of um, efforts from community groups around Australia that wanted to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and look towards um, a future of 100% renewable energy using the vast resources that we have in our country. Um, so we advocated for policies like the expansion of the renewable energy target that Nigel's talked about a bit earlier tonight. Um, and other really big picture policy pieces that have helped get our renewables industry really cranking and get solar on our rooftops. Um, that's the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and that, those types of things. So, um, so uh, in about 2012, um, our founder, Lindsay Suter, noticed something really revolutionary was happening in PV. So back in 2007 when 100% Renewable was um, started, that we had about 14,000 solar systems installed on rooftops around Australia. And as Nigel showed in his slide, and I've got another version of it on this slide on your screen now, you'll see that in 2012 things had really escalated quite a lot. So fast forward to today and solar has taken off. There's now almost 1.4 million solar systems installed around Australia, just solar PV. So just think, from 2007 to today, gone from 14,000 solar systems to 1.4 million. It's kind of hard to get your head around those numbers sometimes. Um, there's a few reasons for that that Nigel outlined earlier. The price of panels have dropped. There's been a bunch of state-based feed-in tariff schemes, which I think many people on the line tonight would be benefiting from. And also big policies like the renewable energy target helped with the cost of installation. So these days there's now 5 million Australians, around 20% of the population who are living under a solar rooftop these days and that's pretty incredible. 
So we looked around and thought, well, could we actually see a community of interest around solar? Are people committed to um, you know, taking that action themselves and people who want to see that renewable future, could we actually have that conversation with people who are solar owners? Um, and as it turns out, yeah, we were launched in May 2013, as you can see um, on your screen there. We just turned two years old and now we've got seven, 70,000 supporters. So we started as a project of the 100% Renewable Campaign and now we're at 70,000 supporters all around the country and we're still growing every single day, which is really pretty, pretty amazing. Now, our objectives um, for the next next couple of years are to ensure an expanded renewable energy target, an expanded renewables goal, and also to maintain those good policies, particularly federal, but also state policies that help get a better deal for solar owners, but also help accelerate that expansion of solar and renewable energy um, around the country. We do want to make sure that people do get a better deal, and so we will be um, your voice as um, solar consumers are, um, when problems arise or you'd like to see see things work out better for you guys. And also we want to see that the solar industry grows and thrives and creates many thousands of jobs. Many, many thousands have been created already, around 20,000 jobs over the last um, 10 or 15 years. And we also really want to build our community of solar citizens, um, solar owners and solar supporters all around the nation who want to see our renewable future become a, a reality. Um, so I just thought I'd talk about some of our campaigns. So just to give you a bit of a sense of what we've done in the past, um, you'll see on the uh, right of your screen, um, when Colin Barnett, the Premier of Western Australia, uh, tried to introduce a uh, uh, cutback, sorry, the feed-in tariff, um, we sprang into action, we signed up 10,000 people, and we managed to reverse that decision just you know, in a couple of days. Um, Hundreds of people made phone calls and thousands of people signed that petition and that, that was a really big win for solar citizens in Western Australia. Um, on the left of your screen, you'll see that we also collected um, submissions into the recent Senate inquiry into the gold plating of the electricity network. Um, more than 550 submissions were received through Solar Citizens um, web tool and we gained national media coverage and were also cited in the inquiry um, report. So decision makers are in the room and we're in the room um, with them, taking your messages straight to them. Um, also the Queensland election was a really interesting campaign that we ran um, because we put out a scorecard. We asked all the parties um, what we wanted to see, including you know, the, the list of asks, as, you'd say, as we say, um, on the screen there. So, and we went to all the parties um, to see you know, what their response would be. Um, and put out a scorecard so people could make up their own mind on how they wanted to vote, if they wanted to vote solar. You'll see there was loads of action in just a very quick turnaround three-week campaign with the Sunshine Coast um, Solar Citizens um, doing some events. You'll see our solar warriors down on the bottom um, left-hand side of your screen and the solar warriors and supporters um, hung around outside Camp Premier, then Premier Newman Newman's electorate office for hours and hours in the rain until um, his staff said that they would actually come and respond to our, our demands. Um, you'll see we also had a mobile billboard running around in some key um, electorates in, ahead of that um, Queensland poll. Um, and we got some quite firm commitments out of um, most of the parties, um, not so firm out of the um, Newman government at the time. But as it turned out with um, Labor elected, we have now got um, some really incredible uh, commitments to analysing a fair feed in tariff to going for a million solar rooftops um, from the Palaszczuk government. But really our biggest campaign over the last um, 15, 18 months or so has been around the renewable energy target and it was the Keep Solar Strong campaign and for anyone who's on the line tonight we really thank you for being part of that campaign if you were. So we started that off by doing a report in cooperation with um, Greenpeace, uh, Asia Pacific, and then we um, held a bunch of public meetings quite similar to the ones that um, the web meeting you're on tonight or ones that we've just recently held in um, five locations around the country where people came along to see, hear about what they could do and take some action and write handwritten letters to the crossbench um, senators including Clive Palmer and 
Glenn Lazarus and um, Nick Xenophon, um, Jackie, Jackie Lambie and Ricky Muir and um, asked them with a handwritten letter in this age of Facebook and email to um, protect the renewable energy target. Um, we also collected, uh, made a group industry letter from um, a whole bunch of solar installers from all around the country. Um, 500 businesses were represented and um, Senator Glenn Lazarus accepted that letter and that was the first time um, Palmer United had made a public commit commitment to the full renewable energy target. Um, we also collected um, 27,000 odd signatures on our um, postcard petition through hundreds and hundreds of volunteer groups around the country and we handed that over to um, our lower house uh, coalition MPs Sarah Henderson and Warren Inch who have spoken out in their general support for renewables. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen there as well we've done um, skywriting and other fun, fun things that can really draw attention to the issue here. Um, back in September last year we held a rally for renewables and perhaps some people on the, on the line tonight had participated in that. It was a terrific day where we held coordinated events in um, ten, um, eight locations with 10 days notice only um, and we held those rallies outside the offices of key cabinet ministers in the federal government and after we held these events where about 2,000 odd people turned up, um, we actually saw the cabinet formally reject the Warburton review of the renewable energy target, the very review that recommended abolishing the target um, in most respects. So that was a really fantastic result from you know thousands of people out there who took part. Um, one of the most key things that people can do to affect change in their communities is by going and making that direct visit to their MP and part of the Keep Solar Strong campaign was by taking people from the solar industry, people from the community, solar owners and supporters and getting them to go in and, and encouraging them to visit their local MP. So we visited a third of the um, parliament, so about 48 MP meetings out of um, the 150 in the House of Reps, um, more than 150 volunteers took part and with all of these handwritten letters that flowed into crossbench senators, um, where we're at now is that the small scale part of the renewable energy target has been saved. So you'll probably hear um, or have read a lot about the cuts to the renewable energy target from the 41,000 gigawatt hours to the 33,000 gigawatt hours which is a terrible thing for, for the industry um, and it's a terrible thing for the future of our big solar and big um, wind projects and how quickly they can happen. But um, because of the work we've done and solar citizens have all around Australia have taken part, that's, that means that we have still got bipartisan full support for the small scale part of the renewable energy target. That's the part that actually covers installations up to 100 kilowatts so um, thanks to the work that people all around the country have taken part in we now have um, the ability for that scheme to keep going and that's a scheme that is uncapped. So it's a pretty remarkable achievement in the face of what was a pretty horrific assault on renewable energy in, in Australia. Um, but <laughs> Things aren't all great, you know, we do have that cut to the target that's in front of us, it's about to go through the lower house is my understanding and it could well be, um, you know, under attack or under, you know, we're, we're not sure what will happen is what I'm trying to say in the Senate. So what we also don't have is any ambition on what the future looks like post 2020. Here we are at 2015 it's only about five years or less until we're at the end of when this renewable energy target scheme runs and we don't know what's next. We hear talk of vision and ambition from some of our politicians but we don't have a lot that's specific. We still have um, you know, the kind of furfies about solar owners costing um, the rest of the community running around which we all know is untrue. Um, solar owners driving up power bills is also an, an outrageous um, thing to say because we all know the majority of your electricity bill is actually made up by network charges, the poles and wires. And those are the, the, the overinvestment in those poles and wires is what's really caused the escalation in um, people's average electricity bills over the years. The other one that is common, commonly comes up is that sol solar owners are the rich people, um, the people who have all the money to go and just like throw it away on on um, extravagances like solar panels. 
again, we all know that's untrue as well. You know, people in low, low to medium postcodes all around the country have the highest uptake of solar. And so all of those things, can, can, we can combat that and make sure that our solar future is secure. So that's why Stand Up For Solar exists. Where we've launched this campaign because we want to see more ambition for our renewable energy future and we want to see what that looks like from our politicians. So we, we've consulted with industry um, and with policy advisors across, across the environment movement and, and from other key, key um, stakeholders and they tell us at least 50% renewable energy by 2030 is absolutely possible and we can chase that goal down. We just need the, the marker in the sand for us to go after that. Um, we also want to see as part of this campaign a fair go for solar owners. We do not want discriminatory charges slapped on solar owners. We do not want to see windbacks of feed in tariffs. We want to see fair feed in tariffs for people who are generating that power from the sun. And we also want to see help for households who are struggling with their current power bills. We, we all know that the most effective way of taking control of your power bills is by going solar and people who are renting sometimes have difficulty accessing that. So we think there's a role to play for, for governments, for policy makers to help people access solar as, 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 um, as their power source. So if that sounds like a good idea to you, here's what you can do. It's pretty simple, three, three things we're asking for from our politicians and there's three things you can do. So you can take the Stand Up For Solar pledge and if you can see me, I hope you can, it looks like this, and I'll show it again at the end. Um, you can take the pledge and also ask your friends, or your neighbours, become a solar neighbour and have a chat to people you know near you who have got um, solar on their rooftop and are interested in becoming part of this campaign to, to grow um, solar as quickly as possible around the country. Um, also, you can become a solar champion if you want to take that next step and it's an easy one with all the resources and help that you might need to get you there. You can join us, um, become a solar champion and take that step to go and visit your MP. Um, one of the most important things that's coming up is the ALP National Conference. So we want to see a really good outcome at that conference at the end of July. And so one of the best things you can do if you're in a Labor um, a, a, an electorate, a federal electorate that is um, held by a Labor Party MP is give them a call, book your appointment as a constituent and they'll sit down and listen to you. You don't have to be an expert to have a good conversation with someone who's a representative in your community. So I'd just really like to encourage you all to join with me and stand up for solar. I'm a solar owner. I've been a solar owner for just about a year now. Um, I've had solar hot water when we for about eight or nine years when we renovated our very you know, dodgy house that, was, um, that is now well insulated, energy efficient and um, is a pleasure to live in and solar has been a big part of that for us. So I want to see that happen on every um, rooftop around the country and I'm hoping you'll join with us and take action as part of our Stand Up For Solar campaign. So thanks very much for having us tonight. Thank you, Claire. Um, just getting uh, things sorted. Um, thank you very much, Claire. Now, we've had lots and lots of questions coming in as we've gone through. Um, I just want to remind people that if they have more questions, they can definitely uh, flip them through to the chat and we'll try and get through to them. Um, if you do have a question and we don't get to it tonight, feel free to send us an email to info at solarcitizens.org.au and we can try and get back to you if we don't get to your question tonight. Um, but I might try and get Nigel and Claire back on the screen with me if that's okay. Um, if you guys can hear me and are able to do that. Hi Claire. Hi Nigel. We've got a whole bunch of questions. I've, um, I'm picking them as we go along. Um, but the one I thought I'd start with is probably for you Claire, but I think Nigel might have a few things to say about this as well. And uh, do you have any comments in relation to the Grattan Institute's recent report on Australia's solar industry? Um, I was puzzled by some of the pronouncements and I thought it was rather negative towards solar households in Australia. Claire and or Nigel? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy to kick off with that if you like. Um, we were quite um, troubled by that report as well. We, it was a little confusing because the report seemed to cherry pick um, and really lay the blame at um, solar owners' feet for costing the, costing the um, countries, costing the public purse. 
we all know that um, the renewable energy target, for example, brings down the wholesale price of power and would have reduced people's bills um, if it had been kept in its current form to 2020. So um, we're troubled by that. The, it does, the report does talk about um, a bright future ahead for solar and we'd certainly agree, agree with that. But really, I think the, the report is, um, fuels the fire in terms of that misinformation that is going around, around solar owners and I think it's, about, it's up to all of us to, to call that out. Yep, I, I couldn't add much to that. Fantastic. Um, now, Nigel, I've got a question for you which I hope you can answer, which is okay. can you explain the items in incentives, please? That's in inverted commas. I think that was included in your presentation. Mm. Um, or yes, I, I can. And, and look, that, that, um, that graph was made up of a variety of different things. I won't labour on it, but there, there are a whole lot of things, um, not only rebates and incentives, so we've had feed-in tariffs in the past, we've had uh, in some cases state um, support for solar, um, we've had um, uh, pro-solar attitudes from, uh, from retailers and from network companies sometimes where things are easy to connect or have historically been easier to connect. We've also had other things that have really helped to get solar rolling along um, and, and to help bring down the price. So, For example, one of the things that uh, incentivised and helped uh, make solar better was the foreign exchange rate. Uh, you know, while the exchange rate was strong, it helped to bring down the cost of solar. Um, uh, and so there were a variety of different things in there. Without going into too much more detail, maybe if, uh, if there's uh, a listener out there who'd like to talk about what those things are in detail, they can pop me an email. So we've got about eight minutes left on the webinar, which we're getting there slowly but surely. Um, one of the questions that came through is, I'm one of those jobs uh, lost. I've been made redundant from the solar companies, from, from, from the solar companies I worked for as a designer and an engineer. What can we do? Um, I want to see whether Claire or Nigel want to respond to that. Boy, that's a real tough one, Claire. I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump in first. I mean, I deal with this one a lot. and. I've, I've um, sadly watched lots of colleagues and friends over the years have to exit the industry and it's a real tough one. Um, you know, one thing I always say about solar is that it's inevitable. Uh, you know, whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow or whether it's next year, the growth of solar is inevitable. So if you've got skills, you know, take heart that, that, that those skills can be used again if not today. Um, it is it is a tough market out there right now, and it is tough for everyone. Uh, I'm in a small solar business myself, uh, just in consulting, so I understand how tough it is. Um, um, you know, I, I don't have any specific advice about getting a job, but I do encourage you to take heart and and to also think hard about where the industry might be in a year or two, and and see if you can adapt the skills that you've got now for where the market's going to be in, in the near term because it's going to keep changing. It's going to be new technologies, there's going to be new solutions, there's going to be new markets opening up. So uh, take heart and, and stay, um, um, stay uh, tuned in to what's going on. If I could just jump in yep. with that, um, just to add into that answer there, like I think what the most important thing that we need to recognise is that policy really matters. So um, industries, um, particularly new industries, do require um, certainty to be able to invest money in growing their businesses, to be able to hire more staff and train their people so they've got the best skills and also so they have the best conditions. Um, I think um, recognising that policy is important is the first step. The second step is actually recognising that every one of us can do something about that. And that's um, part, part of what this campaign's about, is influencing really good policy so we have a strong and vibrant industry that continues to grow. Fantastic. Um, probably got right room for one or two more questions. Um, what factors do you think are preventing the construction of large-scale solar generations like those built in Spain? Nigel, Claire? I'll have, yeah, I'll have a crack at that one first, Claire. Um, it's it's been really interesting to watch the way different markets have evolved, and and I've um, you know done a little bit of work internationally um, in years gone by, and watched Spain uh, grow into you know what was the one of the first very large scale markets. Australia is unique in that um, you know, our population is very dense, 
um, and uh, we have a lot, but we have a lot of uh, uh, free land compared to, for example, European countries or even some U.S. country uh, states. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is that because we have uh, uh, so much coal and so much centralised generation capacity in Australia, and because our demand, particularly in the last few years, has been falling, we don't need large chunks of new energy right now. Um, uh, we certainly need to retire old uh, fleets of energy, and we need to get rid of coal-fired power plants that are 40, 50 years old. They shouldn't be operating today, and they need to be uh, taken out of the market, and we need to you know, recreate and, and re-energise our fleet with new sources of energy. Um, but one of the great things that um, uh, the world has realised that solar can really do is you've really got two choices. You cover a vast swathe of land in millions and millions of solar panels and, and it's kind of a bit like a monoculture. It's like planting a non-native forest and you've only got one species there. Um, and, and there is a place for that type of monolithic type construction. But even better, uh, if you can put your your generation source right where the energy is being is is needed, and that's on the rooftops of homes. It's on the rooftops of factories, and it it avoids all the transmission losses. You end up with distributed generation. Some generating at some times, sometimes uh, some others generating at other times. So you get this wonderful organic diversity, and most importantly, you put it right where it is needed, and that is at the point of load. So. Uh, ironically, by mistake, uh, the government certainly didn't set out when it designed our uh, small-scale residential program to get all those benefits, but it's what we've ended up with, and it's actually a wonderful, wonderful thing. When you look around the rest of the world, you see a lot of other countries now, China in particular, has a huge rollout of solar, and they're desperately trying to put it on buildings rather than necessarily on great big, huge farms. Um, put it at the load, and you avoid the losses is the short answer. Fantastic. Now I am going to finish up the questions there because we are running out of time. Um, just to reiterate to the listeners at home, um, info at solarcitizens.org.au if you want to ask any further questions or work out how to get further involved. Um, now Claire and Nigel, you guys can stay online if you like and participate in this last session. Um, but before we do, um, our third speaker as I mentioned before, Danny Kennedy, uh, we were unable to share the video via the technology that we're using. So we'll be emailing that out as well as with some more steps um, that you and your family and friends can get involved in Stand Up for Solar. But that means we've always met, almost reached the end of this webinar. Just to recap for the campaign, Stand Up for Solar, we hope you can, take the, take the pledge and stand up for solar. You saw this, uh, the sign uh, Claire had before. Uh, be a solar neighbour and get five more of your friends to sign up to become solar neighbours. Or become a solar champion and engage your local MP and ask them to pledge to stand up for solar. Now you will find lots of uh, resources and lots of things you can do at www.standupforsolar.org.au. Um, but before we finish, we want to ask you guys a question. I know it's hard sitting at home, unable to yell out and ask the questions that we'd all like to. Um, but we've got a polling question, one more to finish up. What are you planning to do to stand up for solar? Um, are you going to sign up to, to just take the stand up for solar pledge? Are you going to get fried? five friends to sign up? Are you going to sign up people in your community? Are you get, going to engage your MP to ask them to take a pledge to stand up for solar, for solar? Or are you going to stay tuned for Social Citizens emails and online actions? Remember, you can do more than one on this one as well, I think. Uh, so you might want to do all of them. Um, so I'm going to give you guys all a few minutes to fill that out and um, just give you guys a few more fun facts for the, uh, the, the, the questions and the comments and the commitments to roll on in. So fun fact three, or one of our fun facts, um, did you know that a strong renewable energy target, goal of at least 50% by 2030, will create at least 20,000 20, new ongoing jobs, which I think is pretty amazing. How are we going on that, Nick? 70%, so we've got a few more to come through yet. Um, so remember too, when we finished up tonight, to share this, um, you will be able to find this webinar on our Facebook group, so that's just Solar Citizens. If you don't use Facebook for whatever reason, which some people don't do, which I completely understand, uh, flick us an email and we can send, send you a link so you can actually watch the webinar. Um, and, and it will also be on the Solar Citizens YouTube channel, so you can come in and see our face and hear our dulcet tones, explaining to you about setting up the solar and how you can continue to get involved. How are we going on the, the poll then, Nick? 87, we're going to close it off there now, 87, 87% of people participated, which I think is pretty good. And let's see what people are going to do when the webinar is over. 
just waiting for the screen to come up. 56% are going to take the stand up for solar pledge. 27% will get five friends to sign up. 23% will sign up people in their community. 42% will engage their local MP and ask them to stand up for solar. And 95%, so everyone who participated, pretty much everyone who participated, will stay tuned to solar citizens' emails and do online actions. That's fantastic. Um, at the end of this session, you will get an email, as I said, with our special video message from Danny Kennedy. Danny Kennedy. Um, but we'll also give you the ability to actually get involved in those things. So actually go and meet with your MP, take the stand up for Solar Pledge, and of course follow us on social media. But that's a bit. That's about all from us here at Solar Citizens tonight. Um, thank you very much for attending tonight, and thank you to Claire and Nigel for dialing in from varying spots in offices and homes to talk to the hundreds of people that have joined us from the lounge rooms, workplaces, offices, public transport, wherever they've dialed in from today. Um, and as I said, make sure you keep an eye on your inbox to make sure that you can work out how to keep getting involved in Stand Up for Solar. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Have a fantastic evening, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.